The vast bulk of the commission payments, system-wide, go to the very top. MLM is the only type of business opportunity seller that is not required to make some kind of pre-sale disclosure to prospective participants in the, in the plan. Every time I've looked at an MLM, I see the same things. I see you know, ridiculous earnings claims. I see compensation plans that are weighted to the, the top. And I don't see a legitimate distribution business. It isn't just a case of a few bad apples. Doug, thank you for sitting down with me. Oh, thanks for having me. What is your relationship to this anti-MLM community and how did you get into this really? Well, I, uh, I've been a lawyer for uh, a little over 40 years. In the 1980s, I worked for a firm that did primarily uh, franchise work. And we went all over the country representing franchisees in disputes with franchisors. And then in the early 90s, uh, one of my colleagues and I left to form our own uh, firm. And we started working with a firm that did class action work. And one of the types of class actions that they brought were cases against multi-level marketing companies uh, that were, in essence, uh, uh, pyramid schemes. When I first uh, was introduced to these cases, I thought, well, I've been doing franchising. I should be able to do this just you know, rolling off a truck. I quickly realized that these things were, uh, were very different. One of the reasons was because uh, franchising is a very highly regulated industry with lots of pre-sale disclosures and very sophisticated purchasers. Multi-level marketing, on the other hand, uh, was at that time was not subject to any regulation, uh, and it still, uh, in, in essence, is not. And the people who, who joined multi-level marketing companies were very unsophisticated. Uh, and it, it's, it's portrayed as a business that, you can, that anyone can do. You don't need any special training. Uh, and it doesn't cost much to get involved. But then you know, we, we were finding people that had lost thousands and thousands of dollars at these things. I litigated a number of these uh, cases as, uh, as class actions. And I just got more and more intrigued by the whole process, the whole industry, the types of fraud that, uh, that, that happens. I am now uh, semi-retired, uh, and I spend most of my time uh, advocating for better uh, regulation and better transparency in, uh, in, in this area, which remains, uh, I believe, understudied and causes a tremendous amount of harm to people. It's sort of stunning that uh, it has not been getting the, the attention from politicians and regulators and, uh, and lawyers the, that it should. What was the first time you ever heard about MLM? I think in college, I think um, we were, I, I was in a fraternity and we were pitched by uh, someone for Amway. I, mm -hmm. I, didn't, I, I think at the time I didn't even understand it was Amway. It was someone selling soap. They weren't successful at it. Uh, it was unclear to me how the whole thing worked, uh, and I just I never really gave it another thought. Uh, and then it wasn't it wasn't really until uh, the early '90s that uh, I understood I, that I really paid attention to this. Uh, and and I, I had been in the distribution area for quite a while, representing franchisees, representing distributors in in sort of traditional uh, distribution arrangements, uh, salesmen, uh, and you know that sort of thing. But uh, uh, Multi-level marketing, I'd say, uh, uh, it's really started for me uh, in the early 1990s. Okay, so did any of your friends or classmates get into the soap selling at the time? Did you know of anybody who was like, Doug, you're, you know, it's your, your broke mindset stopped you, I think it's fair to say. Your yeah. broke mindset stopped right. you from getting involved. So That's, that's right. I, yeah, I had, <laughs> I had all, the, all the problems that they right. talk about. So no, no I, 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 don't, I don't remember anyone getting caught up in it uh, at, at that time. Okay, good. One of the main arguments I get from people in the MLM industry is that it's no different than a franchise. You have experience as a franchise lawyer. Can you tell me what, is the, what are the key differences between a real franchise and uh, a multi-level marketing opportunity. I actually think in many ways, and I've been looking in, in particular at, at, at the contracts, uh, that they are, they have more similarities and differences. The key difference is that a franchise is a, is a license of a trademark uh, and, and a manner of doing business and the payment of a franchise fee. The franchise fee can, can be 
five or ten thousand or even fifty thousand, uh, they're they're substantial. They're, they are big investments. When the Federal Trade Commission passed the uh, franchise rule in 1979, they exempted uh, businesses where the initial fee was five hundred dollars or less. Right. So. You, at that point, and at that time, the rule was called the Franchise and Business Opportunity Rule. Um, and so it was designed to cover all types of business opportunities. And there wasn't this big distinction between franchising and, and multi-level marketing. But because of that $500 threshold, the industry sort of goes in two different directions. You have the, the, the standard franchises, the McDonald's, the Burger Kings, Dunkin' Donuts. They go in uh, all in on being franchises and providing pre-sale disclosures and, and the industry sort of gets standardizes and, and the, the, uh, the fly-by-night operators sort of get weeded out. And then the other branch, the, the MLM type branch, they say, well, we'll, we'll, we won't charge more than $500 to get into it, but once you're into it, then you start to, to, to pay money maybe on a monthly basis. The, the line always is no one has to buy anything. All you have to do is buy the starter kit for 50 or 100 bucks and you've got yourself a business. But then you get into it and then you realize that, uh, and then you're, or you're told, well, if you're really serious about this, you've got to, you've got to become a supervisor or you've got to become a, a direct uh, distributor, whatever, you've got to get to the next level. And right. that level involves a certain level of monthly purchases. And that money sort of uh, works out over time to be a substantial investment. Yeah. Uh, but all the other elements are really very similar. There's the, you are running a business according to a format that's devised by uh, someone else you know, you, you weren't previously involved in this business, so they train you. Uh, and so in many ways, these uh, multi-level marketing things really function like franchises, but without the protections that franchises uh, have. Right. So it's all the glitz and glam of being a franchise. I mean, you're, they're using all these terms, independent business owner, they have rank titles that sound super fancy, you know, senior vice president, diamond executive, whatever it is. It's all the allure and all the luster of being yeah. an actual entrepreneur, but without any of the actual legitimacy. Is that fair to say? I, yeah, and I, I, I should say, I mean, the, the other big difference, of, of course, maybe the, the biggest difference is that with franchising, it is a real business. I mean, people are selling burgers to consumers or they're selling uh, uh, donuts to consumers, to people who really want to buy them, to people that aren't themselves part of the system. With multi-level marketing, what you find more often than not is that the people that are buying the stuff are also in the, in the business themselves. Right. The, the market is, it's not so much a market of consumers and sellers, it's a market of, of distributors buying and selling from each other. And that leads to all sorts of problems because you have to ask, where does the money come from? And if, if all the people who are uh, selling the, this stuff are also the buyers, what it means is the money is just flowing from a large group of people at the bottom to a very tiny group of people at the top. Right. And that's why uh, we, we get the term pyramid scheme. Uh, another part of this that really grosses me out is that the companies will report that most of their revenue comes from real customers. And the way they define that is just simply by saying anyone who's not an independent business owner with the company is a customer. Is it really an outside market though if those people who you're selling to are just the friends and family of the current or past distributors? My opinion is no, because it doesn't reflect the true genuine desire for the product like you mentioned mcdonald's mcdonald's i think feeds one percent of the north american population every day people want the yeah. burgers you can go to mcdonald's at lunchtime or late at night and you'll see the drive through is full with any of the mlm companies that i've spent a good deal of time looking at i honestly can't tell you any person 
that really is passionate about the goop or powder yeah. that they're selling. And I have watched probably hundreds of hours of MLM meetings, whether it was in person or on Zoom, just anonymously watching, no more than five minutes in a one hour or longer presentation is spent on the actual thing. There's never any emphasis put on why the product is so good. You would think that they would tell you they're reinventing the wheel, but they're not. They're just telling you this is stuff people already buy. They should have no problem switching over. And you know, if they're supporting a small business owner, that's why they should switch over and a litany of other, you know, if, if you were designing a distribution system, if you had a wonderful product and you thought, well, how am I going to sell this? I'm, and I'm, am I going to go direct to consumer? Am I going to go into uh, retailers? Am I going to set up a franchise system? Those are all options that you have. But I, I don't see anyone saying, boy, we've got this fantastic product. Let's Let's sell it through multi-level marketing. Right. I really don't think that happened. What with multi-level marketing, what I what I see happens is it's it's a compensation plan in search of a product. Someone devises a compensation plan that uh, rewards people at the top of the of the chain, and then they look around and say, well, what are we going to sell? Uh, is it going to be uh, makeup? Is it going to be uh, diet powder? Is it going to be uh, you know, water filters, you know, whatever it is, that comes later, you know. And, and you see the high-level distributors go from company to company. And they may start off in a, a company that's selling a, uh, an energy drink. And this is the best, most fantastic energy drink you've ever had. It's, mm -hmm. it, it, will, it will, you know, keep you awake and make you healthy and keep you thin all at the same time. It's a fantastic product. But then they decide to move on to another company and it's selling uh, courses on how to trade cryptocurrency. And these are the most fantastic courses in selling cryptocurrency that you ever, they, this, you, you will be rich selling these, these courses. It's the same guys doing, you know, and, and then they'll go on to something else. So it's this compensation plan that is the that really is the is the thing that separates MLM from from anything else. This way of rewarding people who are good at recruiting uh, other people. I have said about that same topic. What's more likely that this guy who two years ago was selling energy drinks and saying all the things about them that you were? What's more likely that he went from being an expert on selling energy drinks to an expert on skincare to an expert on cryptocurrency? Or is it more likely that these companies are all just selling the same thing, which is this opportunity and these people have just got the deception and the convincing, you know, confidence man character down to a science? I think it's a pretty obvious question, rhetorical question even. You mentioned before this MLM compensation plan isn't really a logical or efficient way to sell a product. We have things like Amazon, I mean, Walmart, Target, even now they have had to adapt to compete with Amazon. There's virtually nothing you can't get at, with the click of a single button on Amazon. So it begs the question, why would you even want to reach out to an individual to buy something? Most people nowadays don't even like to answer the phone. They would rather text. Most people don't know their neighbors like they did. If someone knocks at their door, they'll have a panic attack. So that is a, a conundrum to me. And also, when a distributor buys the starter kit with a bunch of products in it, how, do, how would the company know whether they sold those products or whether they sat on a shelf in the garage? If a company doesn't know its own sales, it's doomed to fail. If you don't know what your best-selling product is, you can't know what to increase the supply of. If you don't know what your worst-selling product is, how can you adjust your marketing and pricing to compete. And yet, these companies are around for decades, make more money this year than they did last year. So could it be that they actually don't care about selling products to consumers? Could it be that the business model is simply selling a starter kit to a person who then gets three more people to do it? To me, that's the only sale metric that really matters. That, that is the business model. Is the product the, 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 you know, the hairstyling goop or whatever, or the vitamin, or is the product the opportunity? Uh, and that's, that I really think is, is the case, and that is the problem. And you make a good point about the fact that most 
uh, MLM companies do not track where their stuff is, is actually sold. If you go to any other company that is selling products, they want to know who are their consumers. Who, they, they spend a tremendous amount of time finding out who is the, who's the person that's actually buying and using our product. They want to know that information. MLM companies stay way away. We don't want to, we don't, we don't collect that information. That's up to our distributor. They know who their distributors are. They know how much, to, you know, how much stuff their distributors are buying. They track that very carefully, but they have no idea who those consumers are or if those, if right. those consumers even exist. There is one company that I'm aware of that right now has to track uh, their uh, retail sales, and that's Herbalife. And that is as a result of a case that was brought by the Federal Trade Commission uh, a number of years ago. And one of the things Herbalife was forced to do was to institute a means of, of tracking uh, retail sales. But for the most part, for the history of MLM and for, for every other company that's, that's in the business, unlike companies in other lines of, 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 of methods of distribution, they don't know who their customers are. Totally. And, and you can really, you can question uh, whether they really have customers that aren't also distributors. Uh, and, and they will say, the, 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 the MLM companies will say, well, our distributors love our products. That's why they become distributors. They buy and they use and they love our products. And this is where we get into some tricky legal areas because the, the FTC uh, made some decisions back in the 1970s that, that, are, that are still sort of festering today. And one of those decisions was we're going to allow these pyramid structured organizations to exist as long as uh, the whole apparatus is based on retail sales. And in one of the first cases that the FTC brought, a case called Coscott Interplanetary, they ruled that uh, uh, Coscott could not reward distributors uh, unless it was based on a consummated retail sale. In other words, the distributor had to actually go to a consumer, sell it, and get the money before a, a commission could be paid. Then, it, four years later, uh, the FTC decided in the Amway case that they would permit commissions to be paid even if uh, a, the product had not yet been sold to a consumer. Uh, because Amway convinced the FTC that they had rules in place that would encourage ultimate retail sales. And in the Amway system, like every other MLM system, the, the thing that triggers the payment of the commission is the purchase by the distributor. Once the distributor buys, buys the product, then the commissions get paid up, and up the chain uh, as, far, as far as it goes. That put the FTC in the position of having to look into, well, is this sale to a distributor, is that a retail sale or is that a, you know, is that going to, you know, ultimately go to a consumer? Why is this distributor buying this product? Do they really like it or are they buying it to meet some qualification in order to rise in the plan? And in order to, you know, to, to investigate a company, to find out what their motivations are of the distributors to buy these things is a tremendous undertaking. It takes a lot of work, it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of energy to, to, to go through that process. And it, it, frankly, it's, it's a mess because we have probably 700 MLM companies out there uh, following this uh, method of business. The FTC can't look at more than a few of them at a time. They right. just don't have the manpower. Uh, they have this is, this is an agency with a very broad scope of of, uh, uh, of of review. They have a lot of businesses that they have to look at. Um, they can't spend all their time looking at uh, MLM. Something I found with studying MLM is that almost every single term used in the nomenclature of MLM is actually a bastardization of what that real word actually means. You mentioned a few times just now distributor. Yeah. Even the word distributor is nonsense because the companies 
project this idea that you're gonna join the company as a distributor, we are the wholesaler, you're getting the product at a discount from us, and then you are going out there and making retail sales. It's just complete nonsense. The company is factoring in their costs of manufacturing those bottles of goop. When you join, let's say it's $500 or $499, whatever, $497, they always like to end with a seven. I don't know if you've noticed this about guru courses and whatever, but $497, they're factoring in the cost of how much that starter pack was. Something I always try to encourage distributors of MLMs to, to ask themselves is, do you really think this company would risk losing money based on your ability to sell something? Do you really believe that you are, like you think the company gave this product to you at a loss? With multi-level marketing, it's really even difficult to discuss because it would take us all day to sit, yeah. like if you were to really try to debate somebody who was defending MLM and really was aware of this like structure that is designed to screw people over, you would have to spend hours just coming to agreement on what simple terms mean, like distributor, sale, retail. And of course, you wouldn't end up on the same page because in their world, they live in a fantasy world where words don't really mean what they mean. They mean something that they mean for them. And if you don't like that, well, you're just a hater and you should probably be you know, do something better with your time because you're just wasting all your breath. This whole thing, the terms they use, the way they twist up the language, the way that they really are lying in the way they talk. And then you mentioned also the compensation structure ranks. I have described MLM as a Ponzi scheme with extra steps. Ponzi scheme, you give your money, they say, wait 90 days, I'm gonna double your money. In MLM, it's really genius because you're giving your money, you continue to pay them, and instead of a Ponzi scheme where you just wait 90 days, now you have the added burden of trying to bring other people into it and also sell stuff and buy additional like training courses, materials, flying to events, uh, you know, the opportunity cost of your time, spending hours and hours on Zoom meetings. And then even more steps, your sales and the amount of people you have under you that you sell to, well, that translates to volume, which is calculated in points, which they have a algorithm or a formula for calculating, which is extremely, extremely complex and convoluted. And the points translate to what your rank is. And your rank translates to what percentage of commission you're eligible to earn. What kind of business runs this way? Yeah. If I'm running a restaurant, how much did the products cost me? How much did the hamburger actually cost me? How much did I sell it for? What was my profit? Done. Simple. How much do I, what's my overhead? What's the rent? What's the, what I got to pay the employees? In no other system do they make it so complicated. That's why I say a Ponzi scheme with extra steps. It's, it's actually more deceptive than a Ponzi scheme. So sort of a loaded thing. Yeah, I know I'm just yeah, sort of no, ranting yeah, here, but... Yeah, yeah there's, there's like there's like a dozen things I want to respond to. Yeah, but, sorry. But and and I don't want to get sidetracked. There there is a difference between pyramid scheme and a Ponzi scheme, um, and I I think I might disagree with some people about what is you know what constitutes a Ponzi scheme. Which I don't want to get, I don't want to get uh, yeah. you know sort of sidetracked into that. But I think John Taylor did a great study uh, showing that you know you'd be better off in just just joining a a pure pyramid scheme. Like the airplane game, where it's just right. where you know you have the pilot and the two co-pilots and the four, well, however they however they sure. they did it, uh, but at least your chances were better in that in in that system than in the typical uh, MLM where maybe a fraction of one percent of people uh, actually makes uh, 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 good money. You know we were talking about the differences between MLM and franchising, and one one big difference is that in uh, in every MLM. Uh, that I've ever looked at. Once you get above the, the basic introductory level, you get to a level where in order to stay there, you have to buy something on a regular basis. Usually it's a, on a monthly basis. I call these inventory purchase qualifications. They have very complicated compensation plans. Sometimes it's difficult to figure them out, but they all have them. And what it means is that, you know, and I was saying earlier, every MLM says, well, there's no required purchases. All you have to do is buy the starter kit and nothing else is required. Right. But in order, if you recruit people, uh, in order to make commissions when they buy something, you need to account your, for yourself for a certain amount of purchases. And that creates the incentive to keep on buying stuff whether or not you can sell it, whether or not yes. you want to buy, you know, you know, 
consume it yourself, uh, you have to keep on buying. So that, that, those inventory purchase qualifications are the thing that drives the, tr the bus. That's, what, that's the attraction for the companies, and that's what keeps these things going, is all those people trying to meet their qualifications. Yes. Uh, so I, 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 that's one thing I wanted to, to, to clarify. Another thing, and, and this is because coming, coming from a, a franchise background, when you buy a franchise, one of the things that you are concerned about is having a market. Now, uh, some franchise, franchises will give you an express territory. You know, you get the city of Poughkeepsie, or you get a three mile radius, or you get, now some franchises, you don't get a specific territory. McDonald's, Burger King, they don't give specific territories, but they do do very uh, high-end, sophisticated economic studies of what will be the impact of a new store on their existing stores. And you know, one of the cases that I got involved in as a franchise lawyer, what we call them cannibalization cases. That's when a franchisor put a store so close to an existing store that it caused uh, a, an impact. It, it turned the store, the existing store, from a profitable store to a loser. We tried to develop legal theories that, that would uh, enable the franchisee who suffered here to, to recover. And we had some success, we had some failures, but, it, it, that's, but that's, that was an issue, this cannibalization. And there was a recognition on both sides. The franchisee says, has to recognize, well, I benefit from having other franchise stores because there's a network effect. Having McDonald's stores all over the place means that people recognize the golden arches and they know what they're gonna get when they come to my store. So I benefit from that. And, and the franchisor, and the, they recognize that in order to have a healthy system, they need to have healthy franchisees. The franchisee needs to be able to make money they need to have a reasonable opportunity for success. Um, so the franchisor doesn't build a store on every block because they, they need those franchisees to succeed. The MLM, there are no limits on recruiting. Right. Uh, there are no protected territories. There are no uh, markets uh, that, are, that are reserved for uh, uh, new distributors. Uh, the sky is the limit in terms of the number of franchisees, in terms of the number of distributors, I should say. Right. When you are recruiting other people to join the MLM company, you are recruiting your competitors. You are recruiting right. people who, theoretically, they're supposed to be selling the same stuff that you're selling at the same price to the same right. uh, market. If there's a McDonald's and a Burger King opens up next door, that, you know, he can deal with that because... The McDonald's guy can say, well, we have the special sauce. And the Burger King guy says, well, you know, we have flame broiled. But if you have the same guy selling the same business, the same product at the same price, how do you compete with that? You know, it doesn't make sense from a, from a business uh, point of view. Also, one note on what you mentioned before, this inventory purchase requirement. I mean, we could go all day about any one of these elements. Yeah. But one of those things too is because there is that inventory purchase requirement and because your own purchases count towards your own compensation, which is sort of a snake eating its own tail weird idea. What I'm seeing now is people are gently nudged towards the idea of covertly creating fake accounts using fake names or their family members' names whose information they already do possess yeah. and making purchases out of their own pocket in the names of other people to falsify how many in their downline there are. So essentially what you have is this phenomenon where people have hit a qualification to earn, let's say, $10,000 a month. But because they are actually the person acting on behalf of all of these people in their supposed downline, it's just coming right out of their pocket. So you're making 10,000 a month, but you're spending 15 or 20,000 a month. So I just wanted to add that on. I don't know if you want to. Yeah, and that, well, that, that reminds me, you know, if you go back to the old, the true direct selling uh, system where you have, you know, a bunch of salesmen and then maybe you have a, a regional uh, supervisor and then a zone supervisor, the, 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 the salesman who's selling you know, the sewing machine or the encyclopedia, he makes the biggest 
you know, there's a commission that's generated when that sale takes place. And, and the, act, the salesman who, who is responsible for the sale makes the biggest chunk of that commission. A share of the commission will go to the regional guy, and then a smaller share will go to the zone guy, and maybe, the, maybe there'll be a division guy. Maybe, you know, you might have three levels, but the biggest chunk of commission goes to the guy who makes the sale, and then ever smaller parts go to the, the, uh, the upper level. And those, those zone and division guys, they're selling you know, encyclopedias too. Right. The only reason you, they hired you on as a salesman is that they had a big territory and they needed more people to service the territory. With MLM, it's reversed. The person who is theoretically selling to consumers makes a tiny a, a commission and the vast bulk of the commission payments system-wide go to the very top, the tippy tippy yes. top. In a lot of the compensation plans I've seen, unless until you get like at least three people under you in a lot of them, you don't even qualify for any of this bonus amount. It just goes right over your head to, to your to yeah. your upline. You you theoretically you are making a retail profit when you sell the, these products. Right. But that's theory. Uh, you know, the, the, the reality is I, either the stuff is not being sold or it's sold at cost or it's sold to, you know, your grandmother or your, you know, your neighbor once or twice, but, it, you know, it, it, not on a consistent basis. Uh, but the, the, the theory is that, that the, the people at the bottom are, are, uh, are selling the stuff at retail and then that, that commission structure is rewarding the people that are training and, and recruiting and doing that stuff. But the, if you look at the, 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 the payment of, of commissions and the, the, the distribution of commissions, almost all of it goes to the very top of the, of the plan. Uh, and those people at, at the bottom, if they don't meet their, their inventory purchase qualification, they don't get paid, they, they, they don't get paid the commission and the commission goes up the next level. It's called roll-up. And when high-level people go from one MLM company to another, they want to know, you know, what's the breakage? At what point that those commissions flow up to me? Because yeah. they know, I mean, the system is built on failure. They know that most of the people that are joining are going to drop out. Um, they try to keep them in as long as possible, keeping buy, keep them buying as long as possible but ultimately they're gonna drop out and then they have to keep the recruiting machine going in order right. to fund this whole uh, uh, process. Is this roll up you refer to the same thing as what I know to be called compression? Yes, Okay. Got that's, it. Another, that's another term. This idea that you talk about where it's the opposite of the way sales commissions usually work, to me is especially prevalent in these MLMs that sell life insurance. I've talked to a lot of people who are actually in legitimate life insurance sales and it's not atypical for a life insurance salesperson to receive a 100% commission of the first year, the cost of the first year's premium. So somebody signing up for life insurance, the salesman is going to get, let's say it's a $1,000 policy, that thousand goes to their pocket because the company, the policy issuer, is going to make their money on the subsequent years. They're gonna gamble that the buyer is gonna live at least a year. Right. Uh, so that they pay that second commission. Yes, in MLMs that deal with life insurance sales, usually the entry commission is like 20%, which is not at all competitive with the, yeah. the rest of the life insurance sales industry. They balance that out, in my opinion, by having an added layer of outward appearing legitimacy. You actually do have to have a state license to sell life insurance. Yeah. So that makes it seem like there couldn't be a, a scam going on. And also when you sell life insurance, you know, they encourage you to dress nice. You know, you're, a, you know, you're dealing with a very important life insurance. You gotta be a professional. And regardless of the fact, you might be a 19 year old kid who nobody would really trust buying life insurance from. We all are aware of like Tupperware parties and you know, housewives having parties in their living rooms. An insurance salesman who's a licensed state issued insurance salesman, it looks a lot, it appears a lot more legitimate. You know what I mean? So, but I think that's especially dangerous because you are dealing with something that's life or death and this compensation plan might not be the worst thing for the consumer. They might still be getting their life insurance product, but it's not at all fair to the distributors I know I, hate, I even hate using the word. 
yeah, it just looks more, looks more real. It feels more real. They are really actually dealing with legitimate insurance companies and acting sort of as a middleman. Uh, again, you know, a Ponzi scheme with extra steps. I, I just see, I just see extra layers of deception at every turn. Well, what are they told about how much money that they can they can make doing this? And, the sky's and, the limit. And how, well, I mean, that's that's one of the things that we're we're talking about these days is, you know, you and I may agree about whether these things are legitimate businesses or not, but the industry says we're a legitimate business. We are, we're the direct sellers of, of today. And so my, my question is, if you are, if this is a legitimate business, why are, aren't you required to provide some disclosures to people before they get involved in this business? Uh, and if you make earnings claims, if you make a, a representation that it's possible or probable or likely that uh, you are going to be able to you know, buy a new car or, or fund your retirement or pay for your kid's education or, or make $3,000 a month, whatever it is, uh, shouldn't you be required to say, well, uh, this is the experience of uh, of our distributors to date, that uh, how many people, what percentage of our distributors actually make this kind of money? And by the way, if if part of that money is based on retail selling, how much of that is 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 retail selling? And and right. you better track that a, a number in order to be able to make that representation. If if you're if you're if you're saying that people are making money by retailing, well, where's where's the data and why shouldn't you be required, as franchises are required, as every other business opportunity seller is required, to back up your, your statement? Right. Right now, MLM is the only type of business opportunity seller that is not required to make some kind of pre-sale disclosure to prospective participants in the, in the plan. MLM is exempt from the franchise rule because of that $500 threshold. Actually, they've raised it by inflation, but it's still, it's not, you know, it's not too much higher than that. And they're exempt from the business opportunity rule that requires all other types of business opportunities to make pre-sale disclosures because they got themselves a special exemption when, when the FTC passed that rule uh, 10 years ago. Uh, and that was, you know, purely the result of, of very effective uh, political uh, lobbying on the part of the MLM industry. But, you know, where's the justification for that? If you're a legitimate in in industry, if you're a legitimate opportunity, uh, you know, where's the beef? Show us, show us the money. Show us, show us the, the data um, like everybody else has to do. Right. You know, we're here in Washington, D.C., where we're doing this conference talking about multi-level marketing, and a lot of the people speaking are part of this anti-MLM movement. For you, what has changed between then and now when it comes to, like, the public's awareness around these companies and what they are, this anti-MLM thing? Well, I, I'd say when I started bringing... Uh, cases against MLM companies back in the early 90s, for the most part, victims of, of deceptive MLMs didn't find each other, couldn't find each other. They didn't know each other. They, they, typically, they would fail at, at this and they'd think, well, I wasn't following the plan. Or they, and they were told, you're, you're conditioned when you, when you join. Um, well, this business is not for everyone. You've got to follow the plan. If you don't follow the plan, you're not going to succeed. Um, so basically, it's all your fault if you don't if if you if you don't succeed at it. It's not because of the warped compensation structure or the fact that you know everybody else has been recruited already or or, or anything like that. Uh, it's because you know you're a failure. Now, people have been finding each other. The victims have have been found each other, and through social media, victims are now they're speaking out. And this is, this is a, a huge development in the industry and, uh, from my point of view, a more effective job of sort of getting the word out than, than anyone has ever done. People with their YouTube channels or Instagram or other social media that I have no clue about, uh, you know, they're, they're finding 
people who have also suffered from the same thing, and they are speaking out. They are they're warning people about you know these uh, you know these businesses. Yeah. That that is a just a tremendous turnaround in in the the thirty years that I've that I've been uh, looking at this. And I so I think that's that's the most encouraging thing that I that I've seen. And I think I think the FTC is paying attention. I think they do see this. Uh, and we saw this earlier this year where, where the, uh, the FTC uh, said that it wanted, to, uh, it wanted public comments on whether there should be a rule against deceptive earnings claims. Uh, and there was a 60-day period for people to uh, make comments. And there were about 1,600 comments that were submitted uh, online uh, to the FTC. And I've read about half of them and a random sample of half of them, and 95% were by people uh, who, who had bad experiences with MLM. Yeah. Uh, just an overwhelming number. And I think that was uh, very impressive uh, showing by uh, uh, you know, people in, in, the, uh, uh, in, the, in the anti-MLM arena, and, and I think the, the FTC uh, is paying attention. Yeah. Uh, now, recently, the FTC has also given a notice that it is looking at the business opportunity rule that I mentioned uh, earlier. And they don't say that they, are, they might reconsider that MLM uh, exemption, but I certainly hope that that is uh, something that they are, that they are considering. Uh, and it would, it would certainly... Uh, solve a lot of problems. It, it's not the rule is not perfect. It has some some problems. It's not the rule that I would draft if I were if I were the king, uh, but I'm not. Uh, so you know you deal with what you can you know the best that you can get. And the industry you can see the industry gearing up to uh, to 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 fight this effort. We see uh, uh, letters from uh, a few members of Congress, sort of nervously. Warning the FTC not to you know, overstep itself by uh, by regulating this this industry. Uh, we know that there is a direct selling caucus in Congress uh, that are uh, uh, senators and representatives who are uh, receive a lot of political donations from uh, MLM companies and from the Direct Selling Association. So you know the the, the battle lines are getting drawn and. Uh, you know, it's basically it's going to be the power of the people versus the power of uh, you know high-end political lobby. Yes, it's really amazing. I mean, they used to completely control the narrative. There was no social media. They were in control of all the public narrative around it. And usually, the shame was so strong, people didn't even want to speak out because they thought it was like you said their fault. It's amazing how people sitting in their living rooms or their bedrooms making YouTube videos can totally just change the public narrative, like. Not to pat myself on the back here, I just this is something I've observed. If you search the names of some of the companies that I've done videos on, on Google or YouTube, I'm the first thing that comes up. And that I know has been helpful for people when it comes to, you know, oh, I had a meeting set up with this guy today. I'm not going now, I watched this video. I think it's amazing how people have been able to like battle the misinformation that MLM companies put out there. And you're right, I mean, there is a growing closing in of the walls on the people, the politicians who accept this lobbying money, bribery, essentially, in my words, I, I won't put in words in anyone else's mouth, those are my words, because they are eventually going to have to make this decision between overwhelming negative public sentiment and bad PR on their part for supporting MLM and choosing between that and the money they're getting from the direct selling association. I think it's beautiful. I think anytime there's been a change that was significant in terms of like long-standing laws, whether it was, you know, disclosing warnings about cigarettes, abolishing slavery, there's a whole there's a ton of stuff that used to be legal that is now not legal and every time that it's happened, it is because people like the public's demand has been so overwhelming. And so I think we're I think we're getting towards that and I um at least I hope so. I'm gonna I'm gonna continue doing doing my part. You know, it's like I want to keep doing this thing that I've been doing, where I you know show what is going on in one company. Maybe they get reprimanded, maybe they don't, but it's known about now. 
and repeating this process enough times that, you know, it has to become like a glaring question, like, okay, are we going to actually do something about the wider issue? Or is it just a coincidence that this guy, like, could it be that Marco is just manufacturing all these stories? Of course not, you know? So, but, uh, I, I love what you're doing. I, I've, I've seen, uh, uh your work. I've, and I love what, what, uh, I, what I see on social media and I, I am not someone who is on social media. I, I, I've, I've, you know, I've, I go to YouTube. I, I don't really, I, I'm not a Twitter person or Instagram. I don't you know, do that stuff. But what I've seen is just, is people who are, who are basically filling the gap. They, they are doing what the FTC and state regulators should be doing, uh, which is protecting people from, uh, from scams. If you talk to the, the DSA, they will say, well, you know, there's a few bad apples, but uh, this is a, a, a legitimate form of, of business. My, my problem with that is that every time I've looked at an MLM, I see the same things. I see, you know, ridiculous earnings claims. I see compensation plans that are weighted to the, the top. And I, I see people who are, uh, you know, joining and dropping out at, at, at tremendous uh, rates. And I don't see a legitimate distribution business. So it, it is, it's a systemic problem. It isn't just a case of a few bad apples. Right. On that same note, sort of, I've heard you describe MLM as buying a lottery ticket for a lottery that was already announced last week. Can you explain a little bit of what you mean when you say that? Why do you view it that way? You know, I said that in, in, in betting on, on zero, and it, it's something that, that, that I, uh, I had been chewing on for a while, and it happened, there was a case I, I uh, handled uh, some years ago involving a company called Omnitrition. And one of the things that we did in that case um, was we, we were able to, to talk uh, with a few high-level uh, distributors. We, I, I was taking depositions all over the country, but I also interviewed some, some people who are willing to talk with us. And there's two guys in particular, who are very candid. Uh, they said uh, that, you know, they, had, they were experienced MLMers. They had been in other companies before uh, Omnitrition. Uh, and they said, you know, they were involved with Omnitrition from, you know, pre-launch. Right. And they, one of the topics that they dealt with was, you know, how, you know, how are we going to, you know, who's going to be positioned where and who's going to be the, 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 you know, the sort of the poster boy for this, uh, you know, this company. You need, you need someone who is young like you, you know, they, they would have loved to have gotten you involved in this. And then you could have said, you know, I am just uh, 20 something and, uh, you know, I don't have experience with this or that, but I, I joined this company and, you know, within, you know, nine months I was making, you know, 10,000 a month and within two years I was a millionaire. Um, and it would have been true. You would actually have been a millionaire because right. there are some people that actually do make money at this thing. And I'll do it, by the uh, way. They'll... If you're listening, you <clears throat> have to check. I will do it. Uh, you'd be dangerous. Yeah. But, but, but it's a fraction of a percent. It's literally less than 1% that actually right. make a decent money at this thing. But they, they had that all planned out ahead of time. They knew <laughs> that how this was going to work. Uh, and and they, they picked the guy that was going to, you know, was going to have that, that role. Uh, in, in, the, in the system. And, and then I, I, I knew John Taylor for many, many years. He was a great guy. We had one, wonderful conversations. Uh, he never managed to convert me to, to Mormonism, but, but I think he tried in a subtle way. He's a more, he was a devout Mormon. He would never gamble himself, but he, he studied the, the odds at, the, at, at La, the Las Vegas gaming tables. And then he, he studied the odds at, at uh, MLM, and he, and he realized you're, you're better off going to Las Vegas than you are uh, uh, with MLM. Because it's not as if, you know, I, I've been saying, you know, it's, it, you know there's, it's less than a 1% chance that you're gonna, you know, get into that rarefied echelon of, of people making lots of money at this thing. But it's, that's really a little bit incorrect because you, you don't have that chance, not everybody, you know, you don't even have that chance of, of right. making that kind of money. 
because you know the, the train has left the station. You, you don't even have the chance of, that you have when you buy a lottery ticket. At least when you buy a lottery ticket, you have the exact same odds of winning if you buy the last lottery ticket sold as the very first guy that bought the first lottery ticket. You have the exact same chance. That's not true with MLM. The guys that bought the lottery tickets uh, or the MLM distributorships first have a much better chance of rising to the top. You know, you know a lot of MLMers will say, well, you know, so-and-so you know, uh, was recruited later than, than so-and-so, and therefore, but he rose higher, so right, therefore yeah, it's, yeah. it can't be a pyramid scheme. No, I mean, it's not as neat and clean as that. It's not a question of having a, 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 an even chance of getting to that level. You look at the top of, the, of, the, of, of any MLM and you see the same people year after year. Right. Herbalife did, had this on their investors uh, portion of their website for, for many years. I don't know if they st it's still there, but I have a copy of it. It's an analysis of uh, rates of attrition at each level of the plan. Right. At the highest level, the attrition is 0% because people stay. At the bottom, it's 90%. And that's because you know, people who are, you know, get closer to the top, you, they can see other people making, making money. So they stay in it that much longer. You know, they're, 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 they, they keep, you, know, you, you have the sunk cost uh, problem of you know, trying to you know, chase good money after bad. The people who, who, are, who churn at the bottom, you know, maybe they're in it for a few months and they're not out of it, they actually haven't lost that much. Right. Maybe they've gained a little experience and, <laughs> and they're never going to get involved in MLM again and you know, good for them. It's the people that are in it for a year or two years that really start losing right. the, the big dollars. Right. So you mentioned Herbalife briefly. Can you explain what your role was with Herbalife? It was a class action suit, and then how you got involved with the documentary Betting on Zero, which you were featured pretty prominently in. Um, I actually had a number of cases uh, against Herbalife in, in the early 2000s, and they all involved what were called lead generation systems. They were systems set up by high-level distributors. Uh, so when you joined Herbalife, you were not only joining Herbalife, the company, you were also joining this, this uh, system that was sponsored by a high-level person. So you were paying money to Herbalife, but you're also paying money to, to, to get leads and to get a, 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 a set of uh, techniques and uh, a, a whole process of, of recruiting people. So our cases, we didn't sue the whole company, we just sued the, the, the high level, we sued Herbalife, but we didn't, we sued it on behalf of, of a relatively small groups of people that were involved in these different systems. One was called Newest Way to Wealth, one was called um, uh, Vertical Skip Marketing, <laughs> and you can only imagine what Nonsense. That, yeah. And all those cases, we, we, we battled Herbalife for a while and we ultimately settled them. Then a few years later, this uh, hedge fund called Pershing Square headed by Bill Ackman, made a, a presentation, uh, a short sale presentation on Herbalife. And what their, their pitch was, was that uh, Herbalife is a pyramid scheme, that it was going to get shut down, and the stock, because Herbalife is a publicly traded company, the stock was going to go from wherever it was to zero. Pershing Square had shorted a billion dollars worth of Herbalife stock uh, and now they're going to wait to collect their money to, for, the, for the payoff. And, and this is the first time I had ever heard of Pershing Square or Bill Ackman. Or, uh, and I really, I had heard about uh, short selling, but I didn't really understand it. I've never done it myself and I would never attempt to do it. But it made a big splash. And a few months later, or maybe it was even a few weeks later, another hedge fund operator whose name is Carl Icahn. Carl Icahn he got involved uh, as a proponent of Herbalife. So there's this battle of the hedge fund titans, and they're both multi-billionaires. And Ted Braun, who is a, a, just a brilliant uh, documentary filmmaker, decided to film a, a documentary. And uh, he started interviewing 
uh, various uh, people, in, including uh, Bill Ackman and various other people who were, were involved. Meantime, a few months after Ackman's presentation, another class action lawsuit was filed against Herbalife, not by me. Um, I was done suing Herbalife at that point. But another group of lawyers filed a case against Herbalife, and they basically used all of uh, Ackman's uh, research to put this lawsuit together. And they also, and I think they copied a few things from me as well, but, but mainly from, from, from Bill Ackman. And that suit uh, went, went on for, for a while. And then, as class action suits do, uh, that suit was uh, settled, or proposed to be settled. Right. And that suit uh, was on behalf of all Herbalife distributors. So wow. it's, a, it's a class of, say, 1.5 million distributors. And just by comparison, the cases that I had done were on behalf of maybe 10 or 15,000 distributors. Uh, or, or less. Actually, one ended up with the, the, with the way the judge certified the class, so there were only 2,000 class members. But this is a class of 1.5 million uh, distributors. And I got a call from a reporter, and the reporter said, well, we heard that this case is settled. We don't know what the amount of the settlement is going to be. What do you think it's going to be? And I, I did some sort of the back of the envelope calculations, and I thought, well, it, it's got to be at least 100, 150 million in that ballpark because, you know, you figure, yeah. you know, 1.5 million distributors, 400,000 of them are supervisors. That means they've paid at least 3,000 bucks and they probably paid more than that. And they've got, you know, I, I don't, I did the math and I came up with, you know, like 1.5 billion in losses. And I thought, well, a case settling at this early stage, maybe you settle for 10 cents on the dollar. So I, I came up with that, that you know, round, round number. Finally, when the, when the announcement of the settlement comes out, uh, the settlement's for 15 million. So we're talking like a dollar. $10, $10, $10. For, for every uh, Herbalife distributor. Which not only does that not make them whole financially, it doesn't even come close to the amount of damage that was done in terms of the losses of their time, relationships potentially. Yeah. So uh, was this yeah. a disappointing number when, when you heard it back? I, I thought it's a ridiculous number. Right. So, and, 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 and there's another problem here because not only is it a, is it a ridiculous number, but uh, there was uh, an injunctive relief component of the settlement that uh, you know, Herbalife was gonna to agree not to do th certain things. But this is, a, you know, this is a deal. This is something that basically Herbalife has has written. I, at that point in the process, we knew that there was an FTC investigation going on. You know, we didn't know at what point they were at. We don't know what they were going to do. But my concern was Herbalife is going to settle this case. And not only are they going to get away, they're going to get a general release from 1.5 million people for, 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 you know, pennies on the dollar, but they're also going to have this, this ready-made injunction. And then I, 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 the scenario I envisioned was Herbalife was going to go to the FTC and say, hey, we've settled with the class. We've made everybody whole. Uh, we've, and we've agreed to make these changes in our, in our operating uh, plans. Why don't you just sign on to that and we'll pay a fine and, and we'll, we'll go our merry way. And I, I, so the combination of the fact that, that that the, the, the distributors were getting screwed monetarily and that there was this chance that the FTC investigation was going to get co-opted, I decided that I wanted to object to the settlement. And I was uh, approached by uh, a group of distributors who were headed by uh, uh, an activist, uh, Julie Contreras, uh, and, uh, I, and I, I had a few other people contact me. I, I get a lot of contacts from, from people about MLMs all over, all over the uh, country. Right. So I, I had a number of people in Chicago area and then a few per, people in, in other parts of the country. And I went ahead and I filed an objection to this settlement. Because it wasn't good enough. It wasn't, it wasn't right. appropriate. Meanwhile, Ted Braun contacts me and he said, you know, do you, do you uh, would it be okay if we filmed you, you know, going to court uh, to when you when you object to the settlement, and I said sure. So that's how I got involved in that that film, 
you know, Ted Brum uh, and his crew uh, followed me. Uh, you know, we, I had to go to uh, Los Angeles where the case was, and uh, there was a hearing, which you know, they weren't allowed to bring cameras into the hearing, but uh, he filmed us, uh, uh, me, you know, meeting with my clients before. Uh, yes. and obviously, something I wouldn't normally do, but I didn't reveal any any you know secrets uh, there. And, and what happened when you objected? I got slammed so bad. Uh, I, I you know it, it was it was uh, a miserable experience. Uh, I you know I, I had I had great objections. I mean, and I, I could say, you know, I, I could say in my career, I would say it facetiously, I've never been wrong, but sometimes the judges get it wrong. <laughs> this is a case, I was, I was right. Uh, there's just, just no doubt about it. This was a bad settlement uh, uh, for all sorts of reasons. They had not even explained to the judge how they came up with that number. When you, when you settle a class action, you can't just settle it without uh, explaining yourself. Right. You've got every other type of case, you know, the parties can just settle it and, you know, without the judge getting involved. Well, the class action has to be approved by the judge. And you have to, to, to show the judge that this is a fair and reasonable settlement. So do you think and, the judge was in their pocket? Is that why? I don't, I would never say that. Okay. And I don't think the judge was. I think she was heavily influenced by uh, a, a number of things. One of which is that the Herbalife, once the case was settled, they hired a new firm to, to do the settlement. And that's very unusual. Why yeah. would you hire a new high-end litigation firm to, uh, once you, you've settled the case, you know, you wanna, you know, you're gonna lower your costs. Why, why are you bringing a new firm in? Well, the, the, the lead lawyer for this firm was a former judge and it turns out he was the mentor for the judge who, uh, who was assigned this case. Wow. So, you know, she's a very smart, able judge. She has since passed away. But I, I think, you know... She's human, though. She's human. And, and judges, uh, one of the things that you learn, that you don't learn in law school, but you learn fairly quickly once you get out of law school, is that judges are human. Wow. You know, I don't know. I'll never know exactly what happened. But uh, I, I will swear to my dying day that that that, that was a good objection. Uh, but yeah, I I, uh, I lost. Right, and the settlement that Herbalife offered was made even more ridiculous by the fact that I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but class action suits typically the lawyer representing the class is paid on a contingency basis yes. where you don't get paid unless they yeah. pay out. And so when you rejected that. Uh, settlement amount were you effectively rejecting your own pay as well because I was never I wasn't going to get paid the only way I uh, that a, an objector a lawyer representing objectors gets paid is if they improve the settlement oh, so I see. if 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 I had if, if as in response to my objection if the if if the other parties had come to me and said well okay we're gonna raise the amount of money uh, we're gonna do something different uh, then um, I theoretically would have been entitled to some fee based on the improvement in the I see, settlement. I see. see uh, I, my opinion on this whole thing is when I watch Betting on Zero, I think that Bill Ackman was sort of ahead of his time in that putting that type of money into essentially the first anti-MLM video, as far as I see it in like its current form, he, he did a whole media like $50 million publicity campaign around it. Beautiful presentation. Beautiful. I, yeah. I watched the full three hour presentation. Yeah. I think that one, it was too early. The cultural zeitgeist, even a few years ago when he did that, was just not where it is now where a lot more people know that MLM means pyramid scheme. At least that's their opinion. It's certainly my opinion. Yeah. And also the fact that he stood to make money off the stock going down was, I mean, just the easiest thing for th the opposition to pounce on. Is that you're just doing this because of whatever? I think people. That's, that's true of every short seller, though. That's yeah, that's I mean, that's yeah. the, the the way they do the way they justify what they do, and it, I I think it's 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 uh, it's a positive is that they, if they find a company that's committing fraud, they uh, they you know put together a presentation like uh, Bill did. They sell a short and then they announce it.
Yes. And, and then let the regulators do their, their, their thing. And it is a way uh, of, of weeding fraudulent companies uh, out of the market. Yes. Uh, Bill Ackman's big miscalculation was thinking that this process was going to happen, well, happen at all and happen quickly. Um, what, what did happen is ultimately the FTC did uh, do an investigation and they did file a complaint and it was a devastating complaint against Herbalife. That is and something. It, and it didn't happen until after this whole stuff with the class action you know, was over and done. But finally the FTC did move, uh, but they simultaneously with the complaint they also filed a settlement. And the settlement was for $200 million in restitution, which by the way, isn't too far from what I estimated the amount should have been uh, uh, to begin with. But you know, be, that, be that as it may, uh, uh, you know, the FTC finally did move, but they didn't shut the company down, right. and the stock didn't go to zero. So, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm not sure if, if, if Bill had been able to hold on for longer, how, how that would have panned out. I, 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 you know, that's right. just right. not something that I get involved with. But you know, I think that was his, his problem. It's, the FTC doesn't move quickly. They take a long time. They make sure that they taught, dot all their I's and cross all their T's uh, and make sure they have an airtight case so that uh, they go into court. And typically when they go to court, they get an injunction. They shut the MLM down. Right. Aside from the $200 million restitution Herbalife had to pay, do you know what their fine amount that they had to pay was to the FTC? That was, I believe, that was the, the, the full amount. They also had to pay $3 million to the state of Illinois. The state of Illinois was the only state that joined oh, in, in that, the, that prosecution. So they so, didn't actually pay to the FTC, they just paid restitution. No, they paid, they paid $200 million to the FTC, and then the FTC distributed that money to, to I people. Understand. I know you're going to say a few words about Bruce Craig uh, at this conference. Tell me a little bit about Bruce Craig and why is he important to this topic? Bruce was a, uh, spent most of his career as an assistant attorney general for the state of Wisconsin. Uh, he started uh, sometime, I think, in the early 60s. He got involved uh, in, in some of the earliest cases against multi-level marketing companies, that, that, the ones that were big back then. Uh, I mentioned Coscott. That was one of his cases. He, he sued Coscott on behalf of the state of, Illinois, uh, state of Wisconsin. Uh, Holiday Magic was another big one at that time. Best Line. And so these were, and, and those three companies were targets of not only FTC uh, prosecutions, but also uh, a number of state attorney generals. Uh, and uh, Bruce was, was very involved in, in those uh, uh, prosecutions. Uh, he also, on behalf of Wisconsin, sued Amway. And he did something in that Amway case that I've never seen anyone do before or since. He actually got the tax returns for every uh, Amway direct distributor in the state of Wisconsin. Oh, wow. And, uh, and gave them to an expert to analyze. And the expert filed an affidavit in court that said that uh, the average income of an Amway direct distributor uh, was minus $918. <laughs> uh, which is just a you know, perfect yeah. example of of you know, what, we're, what we've been talking about right. uh, uh, here. Obviously, as an assistant attorney general, he, he, did, he handled a lot of other types of cases, but he, he really, he, he, he was particularly bothered by these, uh, these pyramid schemes. Uh, and after he retired uh, in, I think it was 1997, he continued uh, advocating uh, against uh, MLM, and he was, you know, tireless and persistent. He wrote to journalists, he wrote to academics, he wrote to politicians and regulators, just constantly trying to get people to do something yeah. about, uh, about MLM. He found, you know, Bob Fitzpatrick uh, came out with false prophets uh, in the late 90s. Bruce read the book and contacted him, and then, you know, Bob introduced him to me. 
And you know, we just stayed in touch uh, over the years. Uh, just I loved the guy. Uh, he just was a, a real, you know, just uh, a, just a wonderful person and a great uh, example of someone who just you know just spent his time and his energy on on trying to help people. And I, I just think that's a that's a great thing. He passed away last year, and uh, uh, I hope to to say something uh, tomorrow about yeah. uh, about him. That's awesome. Well, I'm glad we could say something about him here too, because you know, like he was doing it before. Yeah. Before it was cool, you know. The last thing I want to ask you about is, in your opinion, you've been doing this a long time. What has to happen in order for there to actually be change. I would hope, you know, unfortunately Bruce isn't here to see it through to the end. I would hope that by the time I have children and they are graduating high school and they're at the age where somebody might tell them, hey, I got this great opportunity that these things aren't around anymore. So what has to happen in your opinion? I think it's, I hate to say it, I think it might be too much to hope for. And knowing human nature, even if these things don't exist, there'll be another scam. I mean, it's just, it is, it is part of being human. There's, there's a scam artist born every minute and there's a sucker born every minute. So I think the best thing that we can do is to, is to try to stay to the extent possible, to stay on top of it, to do what you and other folks on social media are doing, which is studying them, analyzing them, speaking out about them, being in touch with your a representative uh, in, in Congress or in your state legislature, the awareness is, is really, you know, 99% of it. It's, it's got to be, you know, there's, there's only so much politicians can, can do. Uh, and, and there's a lot that, that you guys on social media can do. And, you know, even if the FTC doesn't act, you can spread the word in, in such a way that, that uh, these companies are going to find it more and more difficult to recruit uh, new people. But it's, it's going to be a constant struggle. I'm going to edit over your voice and say, like, it's going to happen. <laughs> it's going to happen right away. Don't worry. Yeah. I wish that there had been social media when you were younger because, you know, if it was a thing like it is now when Robert was writing his first book or when Bruce yeah. was doing his thing, it would have probably been a, a huge thing. So I don't know if that's a point of frustration for you or if you're just happy to see it happening now. But I'll say for me, you know, I think I speak on behalf of every person who's ever watched my videos and certainly everybody in the anti-MLM movement when I say that we wouldn't be able to do what we're doing without people like Bruce and yourself. And I certainly appreciate what you do. And yeah, it's been my privilege to talk to you about this. I, I really wanted to do it for a long time. So thank you so much. Well, thanks, Marco. Yeah. Thanks for what you're thank doing. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. that. All right, thank you. Doug Brooks.